church, we are, uh, we're so grateful. Um, I'll just say, me personally, I am so grateful just to be a part of a church that believes in going and, and sending. And uh, that's not the first time that you've seen a group up here because uh, our church places a high priority on sending um, uh, uh, those of you who are a part of our church to the nations. Uh, we believe we've been called to reach those not just here in South Tampa, but beyond. And we do that best by partnering with ministries and churches all over the world. And so, so excited for our teams going to Colombia and Guatemala. Our student ministry just came back from a trip this past week uh, to the UK where they partner with a local church there. Um, and they ran some sports camps during the week for those uh, students. And our youth pastor, Michael Rivera, uh, had the opportunity to preach at a youth night they did for students in this community. And there were 30 children that gave their life to Jesus uh, on that night. And so we're celebrating that. Uh, just excited about what God is doing um, at uh, STF. Um, thank you for just being here this morning. Uh, we are uh, in uh, Campus Connect this month, which is what, something we do every July, uh, where we come together as a church, um, and we meet here at our Ballast Point campus. Um, and so hello and welcome to those of you from our Channel District and uh, Davis Islands campus for being here. And uh, during this month, we try to make sure that we have the most up-to-date information on you. And so if you would, on your uh, seat, you'll see, or underneath your seat, there's a little card here. If something has changed about your info, uh, maybe you got married and we didn't know about it, um, and um, or maybe you moved or something like that, uh, just fill this out as you leave, and uh, it'll help us to make sure that we can stay in contact with you, um, and we can point you uh, in the right direction uh, with your accurate uh, information. You can fill it out, and you can drop it uh, on your way out uh, this, uh, this morning. Um, so it was, uh, it was the evening of uh, April 26th, uh, 1986. And there were some scientists, and they were shuffling uh, late in the evening into a room to perform a, a routine test at a power plant that they worked at. Uh, and the test went well. Uh, again, it was routine. And so as they were beginning to close up shop, something uh, bad began to happen. Um, some alarms began to go off on their machinery and their equipment. They realized quickly uh, that things were going from bad to worse. And suddenly there was an explosion in the building they were located in. That explosion resulted in a um, re tragedy that for all intents and purposes would change the course of human history because these scientists, they were working at a nuclear power plant right outside of Pripyat, Ukraine. This power plant was called Chernobyl. And see, this explosion did not just affect those who were present right there. They did not just affect those who were in the room in this building or even those in the surrounding town. Experts tell us that the explosion actually resulted in uh, nuclear material, radioactive material, being launched into the atmosphere. And that could be seen in a, if you drew a circle around this uh, location, in a radius of 100,000 kilometers, there was radiation. In fact, two days after this event, uh, there was a power plant in Sweden, uh, which is uh, uh, thousands of miles away from this area in Ukraine. And as workers arrived to check in, they had to do a routine radiation test, make sure they weren't bringing any radiation into the facility. And two days after this explosion, uh, thousands of miles away, uh, there was radiation detected on these employees' clothing, meaning that this event, this tragedy, had effects way farther than they ever anticipated. And it's estimated that over $700 billion was spent uh, in damages that were paid, not just to those who uh, got sick and passed away because of this, but also because of the damage control that the government, the Soviet Union, did during this time period to make sure that this, one, would not happen again, but two, to make sure that the story went the way that they intended for it to go. And again, 40-some years later, we are all kind of still asking the same question, and that's, what happened? How, how did this occur? And experts tell us that there's actually a, a litany of factors that went into this, um, this explosion and this tragedy. But there's two primary reasons, primary uh, things that contributed to this explosion. The first was that the scientists and those who were there were not adequately trained to be doing the tests that they were completing. So they were present... They were in the room, but they were not producing the results and the outcome they were intended to produce. One of the other main contributing factors, and most experts believe this is actually one of the greatest and also subliminal reasons as to why, subtle reasons as to why this occurred, 
was due to the faulty manufacturing of Soviet uh, material during this time period. In fact, in his book uh, commenting on this, his book uh, called Midnight in Chernobyl, Adam Higginbotham, he says this. He says, the quality of workmanship at all levels in Soviet manufacturing was so poor that building projects were forced to incorporate an extra stage known as pre-installation overhaul. Upon delivery from the factory, each piece of new equipment, transformers, turbines, switching gears, they were all stripped down to the last nut, the last bolt, checked for faults, repaired, and then reassembled according to the original specifications as they should have been assembled in the first place. Therefore, most experts believe that when the disaster that was experienced by Chernobyl, it can actually be traced back to various pieces of machinery that were present in Chernobyl but they were not producing the way that they were supposed to. Screws did not operate the ways that screws should. Nuts and bolts uh, were not actually producing the security and machinery that they were supposed to. Transformers and turbines and switching gears, they were all present, but they were not producing. But the assumption was that just because they were present, just because they were there, they were producing in the way that they should. But that assumption, in retrospect, was actually very wrong. And I think that it's dangerous if we miss the reality that it is possible for us to assume that presence always results in production. So the presence of a budget always produces financial responsibility. I can testify. That's not always the case. The presence of a workout plan always produces weight loss. I can testify from those that I talk to in pastoral counseling. (laughs) It isn't just the presence of something that produces a particular outcome. It is the presence of something functioning how it was created that produces an outcome. So Chris, what what does this have to do with me this morning? We can be present at church and yet not be producing as the church. Like we can be here every week, every other week, once a month, whatever your rhythm is. Christmas and Easter, VBS and youth camp. We can be at chapel on Tuesdays. We can be at Bible studies other days of the week. Young adults on Tuesday nights. Youth on Juana on Wednesday nights. We can be present at church and yet not producing as the church. Why? Because presence without functioning as we were created will never result in production. This morning, as we continue our conversations that we've been having as a church family during this Family Connect, this Campus Connect month, I want to talk about your place in this body. Your place, my place. But I, I, I hesitate to use plural language because today I really don't want this to be a message that's about generally uh, the masses, but more about each of us individually. Because I believe that it is very easy for not only our church, but for every single church in America to have a lot of people who are present, but yet not actually functioning as they have been created to function within the local church. And yet, therefore, it is then easy for us to become a church that does not produce the fruit that God would want us to produce. And see, this is not a, uh, something new because this is something that the uh, first century church dealt with as well. In fact, Paul, writing to the Corinthians, uh, who were a dysfunctional church because many of them were not functioning in the God-given role that they had been created to function in, Paul talks about this. He talks about how we can move from being a church where people are just present to being a church where we are functioning as we were created and therefore producing the fruit that God has intended for us to produce. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, as Paul is writing about uh, what should go on in the church and how the church should operate, he says this. He says, the church, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all of its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. 
For we are all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. So Paul's a good teacher. And like what I think good teachers do, he is going to give his uh, congregation, his audience, a metaphor for them to try to understand and wrap their mind around a spiritual or theological reality. And his metaphor is that the church is a body. And a body has many different parts. And so, too, the church has many different parts. And the body has many different parts that have many different functions. And so, too, the church has many different parts that have many different functions. But his, his point here is actually something that's relatively unique. Paul is driving at unity within the church, unity with, uh, with relationally with one another and unity and mission as we uh, advance the kingdom of God here on earth. But he's pointing out that the only way that unity can actually be present is if we embrace the diversity in our midst. He's pointing out that it doesn't matter who's in your midst, a Jew or a Gentile, that's a, an ethnic like I, 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 um, idea or identity, slave or free, that's a social identity, it doesn't matter who you are. You were baptized by the same Spirit. You gave your life to the same Jesus, and therefore, you are one in Christ's body. So today, I want to use the words that Paul has said as a teaching source for us. And again, we're, we're trying to wrap our minds around that idea I said a minute ago, that we can be present here at church and yet not be producing as the church. I want to try to have us leave today with some tools to not let that be true about us. And so we have to answer this question. How can we be present and functioning at church so that we can be producing as the church? And again, I'll, I'll go ahead and throw this caveat out there. This is kind of a family talk kind of message around the dinner table. When I say this, I'm, I'm talking to those of us who are a part of South Tampa Fellowship or have a strong leaning to be a part of STF. Maybe you're here today, you, you're not a part of this church because you don't even know what you believe about God. I just want to tell you, uh, I hope that today will be a message where you can see what we as a church want to be about. Because we just spent the last few months talking about how we represent Jesus to the world around us. And we believe that we represent Jesus really well out there if we start by representing him really well in here. So that's what we're talking about today. How do we represent him well in here, in-house, at the church? And I think that it comes down to not new strategies, not new initiatives or ministries or programs or events, because Paul could have provided any of those for the church in Corinth, and he doesn't. He doesn't give them a new ministry to start, an event to do, a program to run. Instead, what Paul begins to do here when he wants them to move from just being present to be those who are producing is he actually speaks into who they are at their core. Another way of calling that is he is speaking into the culture of the local church, which is what we need to speak into this morning. What kind of culture do we need to have here at STF? To be a church where everyone is not just present, but is functioning at church in the role that God has given to them. We can talk strategies and programs. We have a lot of those. But if we get our culture wrong, everything that follows will be useless. You want to know why? Because as the great theologian, I don't know who, once said, culture will eat strategy for what? Breakfast. Every day that ends with why. That's every day. Culture is not just what you say, it's who you are. Culture is the thing that determines what you do. Culture is the thing that determines how you make decisions. It is about what you cultivate in your mix and midst that actually influences what you do in your midst. So today I want to talk about the kind of culture that I think is outlined in this text that we need to be aware of and we need to cultivate here if we want to be a church where everyone can perform the function that God has given to them. So what does the culture of XSTF need to be? A couple things that we need. One, we need a culture of contentment, not comparison. 
We need a culture of contentment, not comparison. We go on and we continue to read in verse 15. Paul says this. He's going to elaborate on his uh, metaphor here. Now, if the foot should say, well, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, well, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, well, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. He's trying to get at the different parts and aspects of our body. For verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? If they were all one part, where would the body be? And as it is, there are many parts but one body. So Paul's going to elaborate on this illustration here, this metaphor. And he's going to basically be like, listen, here's the thing. So we're a body, right? We're, we're, we're a part of Christ's body. And again, thinking like a body. The, the hand can't get up one day and say, you know what? I want to stop being a hand because I want to be the foot. He says the reason why that's useless is because even if the hand were to say, I want to be a foot, it's still a hand. I.e., just because you compare yourself to another and want to be like them doesn't mean that in trying to be like them, you ever stop being the person God created you to be. Now, you can project a fake version of you that is not who God created you to be. And we say here often, God never promised to change the fake version of you, only the real version. But he's trying to point out the uselessness of comparison. Now, we know that our body parts don't have conversations that we know of with one another. But I think a part of there's a little bit of comedy in here in what Paul is saying. And I actually think that's intentional because sometimes you have to point out the obvious from a different perspective to see why it's been obvious the whole time. And so he's saying to them, listen, comparison is the thief of joy. And comparison will always be present in our culture if we do not have a culture of contentment. That is to say, we do not have a culture that personally we affirm and agree in who God has created us to be. And collectively, we don't spend our entire lives trying to make people in our own image, but instead trying to form them into the image of Christ. What does comparison do that makes it so dangerous? Comparison makes you forget who you are, what you do, and what you have. In the context of this, comparing yourself to somebody else, what they can or cannot do, their abilities they have or do not have, what that ultimately causes you to do is you take the focus off of you, who God has created you to be, the gifts that he has given to you that you can cultivate, and instead you spend your time obsessing over somebody else. And when you obsess over another, you forget what you already have. So how could you cultivate what you have? Can I tell you the most toxic aisle for me at Home Depot? It's the grilling aisle. It's bad. And the Home Depot over here on Gandhi, they put it right there in the front. Like as soon as you walk in, it's like, oh, it's right there waiting for me. Now, con confession, if you don't know, um, I, I have a grill. Sorry, I have, I have, I have four grills already. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, for different reasons and different purposes. I, I have a smoker for the long, you know, briskets and pulled pork and that kind of thing, ribs, right? I have a uh, flat top, blackstone type thing, right? Because every now and then we got to get our hibachi chef going. Um, I've got a small little like charcoal grill if I want to just sear a steak real fast. And then I have a fire pit where if we want to do like a big cookout, I can do it there. Stop judging me. And so... Uh, Despite that, when I walk in, I did this yesterday. I walked into Home Depot. I walked right over to it. My wife was with me, and I looked at her, and I said, I think I need that one. <laughs> she was funny. Like, when I say that about, like, anything, you tell me I don't need anything else. I said, I know, Rachel. This is called hypocrisy. Just walk with me in this. <laughs> and I'm walking around. I'm saying, well, this is the newest, like, smoker. Oh, that's the newest charcoal grill. And I'm, and, I, and I'm the whole time, it's like I'm forgetting the fact that I'm about to go home to four different cooking devices in my backyard, in addition to an oven and a microwave inside. That's what comparison does. You can be present but not producing if you're not walking in the function that you've been created for. And I would just say that I think for many of us, one of our greatest enemies of stepping into what God could have for us here in the local church is that we compare ourselves to others and we say, because I'm not like them, I can't do you fill in the blank. I'll be honest with you. 
this church has a lot of needs because we are a church that at its core exists to serve. And you know your life has a lot of needs, as does mine. So if we're going to be a church that's not performing and not just putting on productions, we're going to be a church that's seeking to meet the needs of those within our midst and those that are around us. Needs are not just met by resources. Needs are met by people. And the greatest way the enemy could tell you that you can't be used to meet a need is by looking, telling you to look at someone else and going, well, because you're not like them. You're not as outgoing as they are. So why would you ever go and serve in kids' ministry? You don't, you're not as deep theologically as she is. So like, why would you ever go to a women's Bible study? You, you, don't, you, don't really get, you don't have this problem figured out in your life, so why would you ever be a part of Titus 10 men's discipleship? The root of all of this is a lack of contentment, realizing, a lack of realizing that I have been created by God. God has a story that he's working out in me. But in despite of that, and in spite of that, I'm going to compare myself to others who do not have my story, who do not have my life, who do not have my experiences. And I'm going to say that they're my permission to not do what God has called me to be and to do. See, we have to understand that the body can't just be made up of a bunch of feet. That'd be weird. Can't just be one big nose or one big eye. Why? Because God has given all of us particular gifts, and the body only moves forward when all the gifts are working together at the same time. What is, what is your gift or gifts that God has given you? Do you know? I don't really have any wrong because the spirit of God lives in you. Earlier in this passage in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, it says this, that the things that the spirit does are evident. Pneumaticos in Greek. It literally means if the spirit lives within you, the spirit does what the spirit does through you. And we have all been called to serve Jesus. And in serving Jesus, there's a lot of things that happen in our life, right? We are all called to uh, encourage people and to exhort people and to uh, uh, speak words of faith over people and to pray and those kinds of things. The things that we have got, God's called all of us to do. But a gift from God is an unusual effectiveness and a responsibility that has been given to every believer. So it's an unusual effectiveness that you have. In something that God has called everybody to. You say, oh, you know what, Chris? Encouragement is just not my gift. Doesn't mean you're not still called to encourage people. It's just a little harder for you than others. Serving is just not my gift. No, we've all been called to serve. But in serving, you might realize that you have a special effectiveness at that. What is your gift? There's a lot of methods, right? You can take some tests, and there's some surveys you can fill out. I want to give you a, a method that's not unique to me. I, I've read it in a book um, called Jesus Continued. It's a book about the Holy Spirit. It's by Pastor J.D. Greer. He's a pastor of Summit Church in North Carolina. He created a Venn diagram that I want to show you this morning. I think it'd be really helpful for us as we think about finding and determining our gift. He said, your gift is at the intersection of your abilities, your affinities, and your affirmations. So each one. Ability. Like, what are you naturally good at? Are you naturally good at explaining things? Are you naturally good at loving people who are difficult to love? Are you naturally good with children? Are you naturally good with young adults? Are you naturally like engaging one-on-one -on -one with people? Are, are you, what are you naturally good at? What are your just basic abilities? Because we do believe that all truth is God's truth. And we do believe that God has created all of us with specific and special abilities that are unique to our personality. The worst thing we can do is to say the only way you can be effective is for you to have abilities like everyone else. We know that's not true. What are your abilities? Second, what are your affinities? Another way to talk about this is like, what are you passionate about or what are you burdened for? What keeps you up at night? What do you have a heart that breaks for? What do you have a passion for? Then affirmation, that's what other people call out in you. Because here's the problem. You might think you're really good at explaining things. And someone might say, hey, listen, I know you might want to be good at that. You're just not there yet. Or the flip of that. 
hey, have you ever thought that you're really good at teaching? I've never taught before. Yeah, but like when you like, you know, you explain like that project you did at your house and how you, you know, like you replaced your sink. Like I didn't have to go to YouTube afterwards because you explained it so well to me. Someone else calls it out of you. Typically, J.D. Greer says that at the intersection of those things, your abilities, your affinity, and your affirmations is a gift that God has given you. The best way to step into the function of God has given to you is to know how God has created you and the giftings that he's given you. But we will never do that if we are busy being a people who are too busy comparing ourselves to others and not content in who God has created us to be. We need a culture of contentment, not comparison. But, you know, there's actually something, another type of our cult, another part of our culture that actually will contribute positively or negatively to the comparison in our midst. The second thing we need to talk about our culture is this. We need a culture of critique, but not criticism. Critique not criticism. You say, Chris, those are synonyms. I would argue differently. Let's keep reading. Verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, he's continuing again with this metaphor, well, you know what? I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. And on the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that are, we think are less honorable, we treat them with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. He's talking again about the diversity in our midst, but all predicating by this fact that we can so easily say, I don't need you. But God has put all the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but so that its parts should have equal concern for each other if one part suffers Each part suffers with it, and if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. See, Paul is trying to point out here that it is so easy for criticism to step into our midst, and criticism does not build a culture of those who are confident and content in the calling that God has given them. Criticism breeds a culture of comparison, because that's what criticism is based in. It's me comparing you to a standard that I've created or it's me comparing you to a thing that I think that you should be. That's going to breed comparison. See, Chris, but I feel like criticism and critique are very similar. Let me see if I can differentiate between the two. Again, look at that first line, right? If we could go back to it. In, uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, 21, he says that the eye cannot say to the hand that I don't need you. The eye says to the hand, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need you. That's destructive. And that's one of the differentiations between criticism and critique. Criticism is purposefully destructive. Critique is purposefully constructive. Now, let me, let me pause here and, and make this point. A healthy church should never be a church where there is never any type of disagreement. Let me say it again. A healthy church should never be a church where there is never any type of disagreement. That is to say, disagreement is actually a pathway to healthiness. The problem is when we allow disagreement to turn into division. That's when things get unhealthy. Criticism is purposefully destructive. So it takes disagreement with someone and then it attempts in the midst of a disagreement to destroy the other person. Whereas critique is purposely constructive. It's seeking to build others up. What does this mean on a practical level? It means that we should be a church where at times there is friction. Friction because someone is stepping into your life and calling out an area in you that is not godly. Friction because of a decision that someone makes that is not in line with who they say they are as a follower of Jesus. Friction because someone is here and they're present, but you identify in them and others identify in them that they should be stepping into something that God has for them here. That will only happen maybe through an affirmation conversation that feels at times difficult. Criticism 
destructive, critique, constructive. Also meaning someone can critique you and it doesn't necessarily have to mean that they're trying to personally attack you. How would you know if they are? Well, here's a second differentiation. Criticism is from a human point of view. Critique is from a godly point of view. So the pushback or whatever that you might receive from somebody or you might offer to someone, I would ask, where is the basis of that? Why do you feel that way? Why, why are you thinking that you need to say that to them? Or why did they say that to you? The motive behind it. Is it godly or is it from a human point of view? Last thing, criticism demoralizes, but critique encourages. Again, if we're not going to have a culture of comparison, we can't have a culture where we use our words to tear other people down. I'm purposely going to say things to you and about you that are going to hurt you. Now, I don't know if any of us wake up and go, you know what, I'm going to be like a person who criticizes people today. That's what I want to do. In fact, that's my contribution to the church is I want to be a critical person. That's what I want to do today. Why is this so important? Look at what Paul says in that verse one more time, verse 24. He said, God's put the whole body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. Why? So that there should be no division in the body. That is why this is important. And I think that criticism can easily seep into our midst and therefore result in a church that isn't doing what God has called them to do because there is a sin that all of us are way too okay with in our midst. It's called gossip. You notice in our own lives we have like acceptable sins and unacceptable sins. I would never say that or I would never do that. Same thing can happen in the church collectively. And we don't walk up to someone and say, hey, if you have five minutes, I'd like to gossip with you about something. <laughs> no, it goes, hey, can we get coffee? I just want to pick your brain about this thing going on at church. If they're the thing that's going on at church, yeah, pick their brain. But if they're not, you're gossiping. You're not practicing Matthew 18. Hey, I just want your advice on this thing. How do I know I'm gossiping? When I'm talking with others about an issue I have with somebody else. Matthew 18 outlines a very clear way that we actually address things with other people, how we go to them one-on-one, -on -one. if they do not listen, then we go to them with another brother or sister in Christ. If they don't listen again, then we get the church leadership or staff involved and come and so, like, there's a process, but most of us, man, we just skip that first part. I'm just telling you, <clears throat> criticism will run rampant in our midst if we do not get a handle on the sin of gossip in all of our lives. I'm speaking to myself because I know that I can so easily, rather than go to a person I have a problem with or an issue with or have a frustration or whatever it might be, I can just so easily talk to other people around me. And you know what? When you talk to other people around you about the thing that you have a frustration or an issue with, you know what we're typically very good at? Not really painting the other side in the best light. Or another way to put that is someone's probably not going to walk away from with our conversation thinking we've done anything wrong. We have to be a culture of critique where we're pushing and we're challenging. But we're not criticizing. And I want you to know just as a caveat, as a staff member, as a pastor and leader at this church, that is true of us as well. Our staff is held to this standard. If you ask our staff in staff meetings, what is the primary thing that will result in, if you want to call it a rebuke from our leadership, from even Pastor JJ, it's going to be this. <clears throat> when we sense that there is gossip or there is criticism in our midst. Our staff is held to this standard. I would say, as another caveat, our staff is held to this standard not just by our own staff, but by you as well, meaning we have actually platforms and pathways for you. If you have frustrations with our church, with myself, Pastor JJ, anybody in our church, you actually have a way that you can reach out to us because we are held accountable. We have given our lives over and said, here we are, here's our decisions, here's how we think. Do with this what you will according to God's word. We can't ask you to do that if we would never actually do that ourselves. We have to be a place 
Of critique, yes, but not criticism. And here's the last thing, and then we're going to close. We need a culture of commitment, not complacency. Again, we're talking about how we move from just being present to actually being an active part of the body, right? Functioning in our role. But we have to move from just mere complacency to commitment. We need a culture of commitment. Look at what he says as we finish this chapter, verse 27. He says, now you are the body of Christ. That's important. He doesn't say, now you are the body of the local church. No, he says, you are the body of Christ, meaning this local church assembly is a picture of Christ's body here in South Tampa. Each one of you is part of it. And God has placed in the church, he's going to give some roles now, some different offices. First, apostles, prophets, second, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing and of helping and of guidance and of different tongues. And he says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret? The, the, the assumption he's trying to get there is, no, all do not. He says, well, then now eagerly then desire the greater gifts. And what's interesting is he's actually going to go on and describe what the greatest gift we can all have is, which is none of those things he just mentioned. It's love. Now, again, we could spend a whole sermon talking about each, every single one of these individual gifts and things. But the point that I'm trying to make here is this. We are members of Christ's body. Therefore, the only way we can operate truly as a member of Christ's body is if we are committed to being members of Christ's body not just complacent about that reality that we've been saved into. Indifferent about it, if you will. Think about it like this. Christ gave his body for us on the cross so we could be members of his body here on earth. So why do we take the body of Christ so casually? Why do we take our role as part of his body? Because listen to this. We are his A-team. We're the varsity Meaning if God wants his hand to be felt in this world, he's going to use his hands to reach this world. If God wants his feet to be felt in this world, he's going to use his feet in this world. But we will never actually be able to live into our God-given calling and our God-given purpose if we are complacent about that role to begin with. What is complacency? Complacency is when you quit but you don't leave. Some of you, maybe you grew up and you had parents who were complacent. They were there, they were present, they were in the home, but they quit emotionally, spiritually, relationally. I think we could probably even argue when it comes from a relational standpoint, complacency in a relationship is more difficult than loss in a relationship. Because if you leave, at least I know what you're doing because your feet are following what your mouth is saying. The flip of that is, though, think about it in here. Could it be that it's actually more unhelpful and more unhealthy for us to continue to be a church that grows and that people are present in, but if we remain complacent, that is to say, we've given up on the mission of God. I don't mind if anybody comes in here on a Sunday and gives your life to Jesus. It doesn't affect me one bit. Oh, we had a baptism this week? That was really sweet. We were able to do that. We shift that mindset to a mindset that says, every time I'm here, I'm a part of this church, I'm anticipating God's going to move. I'm anticipating something's going to happen in worship. It's going to stir. It's going to transform people. I'm anticipating when the gospel is preached from stage, people are going to respond. I'm anticipating that in my own life, I'm so committed to the mission of God that I'm going to be an individual who is going after my neighbors, going after my coworkers, because I am not complacent. I am committed to this. We need a culture of commitment, not just complacency. I can tell you with full assurance, I believe every single person in this room that calls STF their home has a place here. That place might look different than the people that are sitting around you, but you have a place here. So as we close, how can you move from complacency to commitment? Two real simple things as I'm wrapping up. First, commit to our church through membership. Church membership is something that's not talked about a lot today in local churches. In fact, I was with a pastor up in Tennessee a few weeks ago, and we were having a conversation about some things that are going on in this church. And I said, well, hey, have you got your members together to have this conversation? And he goes, well, we we don't do church membership here. 
I said, oh, like, can I ask why? He goes, I just don't see it in the Bible. I said, okay. So what about the fact that every New Testament letter is written to the saints in whatever city they're in? To the saints in Corinth, to the saints in Ephesus, to the saints in Galatia. What about in the book of Hebrews where it is told to pastors that we need to shepherd the flock that God has given to us? How can I shepherd you if I don't know you're part of the sheep? Why is church membership important to us? Because it's not just a formality or a paper you sign and you get on the roll. Church membership is you saying to us, I'm committed to this local body, and it's us saying to you, we're committed to your spiritual development in this local body. Next week, we actually have a class that we do every single month, every other month. It's called Discover. It's a way that you can learn more about STF. Today, before you leave, you can pop by that table right there, the tent outside. You can sign up for that class. Going to that class doesn't officially make you a member. It just gives you all the info you need to become a member of STF. Commit through membership. Here's the second thing. Contribute through serving. Again, I believe there's a place for every single person here in this local body, every single one of you. And today, as you leave, we're actually going to give you an opportunity to take that step to contribute, to commit through serving in the local church. As you leave today, and you probably saw it as you walked in, they have tables all throughout the lobby. These tables represent the various ministries that we have here in our church, ministries for the next generation, kids and youth and young adults and Ministries for you and your family, right? A marriage ministry, men's and women's and missions and, 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 and ministries that actually contribute to what happens here on a Sunday morning. Worship, production, tech, photography, whatever it might be. When you leave here today, if you don't have a place in this church that you have stepped in and you're saying, no, this might be where I contribute. This might be where I function how God has made me. I just encourage you. Pop by the one that speaks the most to your heart and give them your information. You're not signing on the red line. You're not, you're not, you're not making, you know, giving your life away to them for a three-year contract. You're just giving them information that they can utilize to encourage you, to shepherd you, and to help you move from just being present to being someone who produces. I can't do that for you, though. No one can make that decision for you, and I can't guilt you into that. I mean, I can give you the stats of how many leaders we would need in our kids' ministry to make sure we have a safe environment there. I I can can give you, but I'm not going to do that. I don't want you to see this as a guilt trip. I want you to see this as an opportunity that we have in front of us. As the band comes back out, as I talk about this subject, I'm just, I'm always reminded of someone who took a step at some point in their life to contribute to their local church and the impact that it had on me. I was 14 years old. I was a ninth grader. And my family and I were going to Idlewild Baptist Church, right? Just right up the, right up, right up the road. Uh, we, were, we would go, you know, pretty much every Sunday. And so I had a small group leader. His name was Rob Hopper. And uh, I was the kind of kid, though, I went to church on Sundays, but that's about all I did. Didn't go to the events, didn't go to the functions. Like, I didn't do anything else. I just went to church on fun- Sunday because mom and dad made me go. Well, there was a uh, Disciple Now weekend called Go Deep Weekend, and they had announced it and talked about it, and I had not told my parents about it because I did not want to go to it. Didn't have a lot of good friends there, didn't know how many people I would connect with there, so on and so forth. And so it's the Friday of the event. It's about 6 p.m. The event's already started, and I get a text on my phone from Rob Hopper, and the text says, dude, are you coming to Go Deep Weekend? Now, unfortunately, uh, I had a rule in my parents' house uh, where I had to give them my phone whenever they asked for it. It's a good rule, parents. You should implement it with your teenagers. And so my parents said, hey, let's see your phone. Who are you texting? So I give them my phone. They see, well, who's this guy? Oh, he's a small group leader at church. Well, what is this thing? Well, what's an event happening? Why didn't you tell us there was an event happening? Because I didn't want to go to it. Well, you're going to it, Chris. <laughs> I go, well, I don't have a ride. And so my mom texts back, can you come pick me up? To which he replies, yes, I'm on my way. So I go pack my bag or whatever, and I go, and Rob picks me up, and it's like 1985 Civic or whatever it was, and I hop in. There's like a 22, 23-year-old college kid. I jump in the car, and so we drive up, and, uh, and he looks at me. I'll never, he looks at me in the eyes, and he goes, man, I'm so happy you're going to be here this weekend. Go to this trip, and uh, Rob is actually 22, trying to figure out his life. He was learning how to cut hair. I volunteered to let my hair get cut. My mom was not happy about that decision, and uh, had this weekend. A couple things. Didn't give my life to Jesus this weekend. Didn't get baptized this weekend. Didn't realize a call to ministry this weekend. If you talk to the youth pastor at the event, they'd be like, hey, Chris Dotson, was his life transformed? He'd say, I don't really know. 
But after that weekend, my parents made sure I never missed another event with that suit of ministry. Camps, I was there. Retreats, I was there. Why? Because they saw someone who took an interest in me. At a big church, a large church, someone took an interest in me. Fast forward, I graduate from high school, I go to college, I get called to ministry. I feel a sense and a stirring to serve in the local church. I get an opportunity to intern at that same church, Ottawa Baptist Church. Two years later, they call me, and as a 21-year-old, don't know what they were thinking, they hired me to be a student pastor at that church. I served there for eight years, and I would tell you, if there's any part of me and my family that has blessed you in my ministry here, it's because of what I learned serving and going to that church for most of my adult life. Because Rob Hopper said yes to the function that God had given to him and took a step. Rob doesn't serve in ministry. He actually opened a barbershop in Atlanta, Georgia, and he's killing it now. (laughs) But Rob took a step. And Rob was obedient. And he didn't know what it would do. But now I get to reap the fruit of it. I think there's a lot of Rob Hoppers in this room. We just got to be willing to say yes. So Jesus, help us to say yes. Help us to be honest. Help us to be obedient. Help us to be the people you have called and created us to be. In your name, Jesus. Amen.